Welcome to Speaking of Higher Ed, Conversations on Teaching and Learning. This podcast is produced by the Center for Instructional Innovation at Augusta University. I'm your host, Andrew Everett. This is episode eight. We release new episodes the third Wednesday of each month in the spring and fall semester. Please take a moment to rate, review, subscribe, and share the podcast. The purpose of the podcast is to provide a resource to help you create engaging and meaningful learning experiences. Our guest today is... Neil McKinnon. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Dr. McKinnon is the Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs and Provost here at Augusta University. For listeners who don't know your story, will you please share your story that brought you to AU? Yeah, yeah. Well, well first of all, you know, thank you for having me on the podcast. Number eight, I mean, that's pretty exciting. You're like almost up to double digits, Andrew. <laughs> so you're, you're getting there. Um, but yeah, probably listeners can probably tell if they don't know me from my accent. I'm not originally from Georgia. Surprise. Uh, originally from, from Canada. Uh, but I, a lot of my graduate work was was completed in the United States. So I'm a dual citizen of, of both both countries, as uh, are my wife and, and three daughters. Um, but, uh, you know, a fairly typical academic path. Started as assistant professor, associate full professor, department chair, dean. And then uh, that led me here uh, just over two and a half years ago. So uh, trained as a pharmacist uh, my whole Life I've been in academic health centers, and which Augusta University is. It's, it's Georgia's only public academic health center. But the cool part of being a provost is it's much broader than just healthcare. I get involved in different aspects of the university that we I suspect we might talk about later on. So, uh, so yeah, it's, it's a definitely a, a wonderful, uh, simply incredible place to, to work, and uh, very very blessed to be here. And different weather too. Weather is much better than Canada, <laughs> especially in. Uh, you know, November through April, I would say, in particular. <laughs> well, we're glad you're here. And our topic today will cover your role as provost and getting your insights on elevating the higher yeah. education experience. The first question is pretty easy. What do you enjoy most about being provost? Yeah, well, I guess, you know, probably a lot of a lot of listeners, both internal and external, might not even know what a provost is. And I get that question a lot. Um, so really, a provost is, you know, I'm the chief academic officer uh, for the university. Uh, for example, the, the deans report to me. But also at AU, it's really an expanded role. So also oversee things like uh, diversity and inclusion, strategic planning, uh, the research enterprise, and, and a few other things as well. So it's a pretty broad role. Um, so there's a lot of different things I like about it, but I'd have to say, you know, really kind of two main would be, uh, the first one would be really that the people I interact with uh, and a wide variety, you know, staff and students and faculty and academic administrators. And so I know two days are the same. Um, and so I think I really enjoy that. And I think the other part is just the impact I feel I can make in the position where, you know, um, this semester we're starting a new school of public health. We're launching three new degree programs. Uh, and so things like that, where it's really uh, hopefully helping move the university forward on, in, a, in a different way. And so, um, uh, again, it's a very uh, different kind of role. Of course, there's there's like any part of any role, there's things, you know, that are more challenging, sometimes HR issues or things behind the scenes. Maybe I don't share on social media, but but overall, I really feel blessed. And it's uh, it's a really uh, very, very interesting and intellectually stimulating role. So, Well, it's clear that you place an emphasis on connecting with faculty, yeah. staff, and students. How do you believe faculty-student connections impact the student college experience? Yeah, it's actually probably has one of the largest impacts on the student experience. And I can you know, think firsthand of myself, uh, when I was an undergraduate student, um, I ended up uh, doing research with one faculty member one summer. And just that, that summer of spending time with her uh, learning the research process. I remember presenting the research results at a national conference and I was scared and she was in the audience and kind of encouraging me. And that really led me to go on to do a master's in, in PhD. So I think the impact that faculty can have uh, li like that is is truly incredible. The other kind of cool part as from a faculty perspective is just seeing your students go on and do cool things. And again, a, a former student of mine, um, back in the day I taught uh, pharmacy students so she was in my class. She ended up doing research with me, just like I did with that other faculty member. She ended up uh, moving to my former hometown where my parents still live. She bought the pharmacy I used to work in, and now she's my parents' pharmacist. And so that kind of almost circle of life thing as well. And I think that's what's, uh, you know, sometimes students may not think about that. They also inspire us as faculty, um, and especially when you go on and see former students go on and do really cool things like that. So I think I'd say the relationship works in both directions. Uh, but but clearly, um, I, I think most students, by the time they graduate, hopefully across that stage at commencement, 
they're thinking of, you know, two or three faculty that really made a difference along the way. So can you share some of the uh, strategies or initiatives you've implemented or plan to implement to continue to improve the uh, academic quality of our programs? Yeah, well, a couple of things that kind of come to mind, uh, certainly uh, with, with when COVID hit us just over three years ago, uh, every university across the world really kind of moved to online instruction. And uh, certainly Augusta University was, was not alone in that. Certainly there was online instruction before COVID, but that really tested us all. And then since COVID uh, as well, um, we continue to do online instruction. But but certainly uh, one area that we've really emphasized is kind of launching something called Augusta University Online. And actually this fall, the first three programs launched. And so something we've been planning for really almost two years now. Uh, so though, as of uh, the time of recording this, we have about 160 students. And we've actually shattered our enrollment projections, I think, twice, if not three times already for this fall. And the idea is really um, to provide a very high level, almost a concierge level service of online instruction, 24-7 tech support, uh, additional support as well to faculty. And I think, you know, for those of us um, that have taught online, you know, we, we all know it, it's different than just putting a PowerPoint and talking over it. You want it, you need to find ways to make it engaging. That's what our aim is with, with AU Online. So that's certainly that's that's one way. I think the other way is just offering new degree programs that meet uh, workplace market needs, but also be appealing to students. And so with this fall, for example, um, first day classes, we're offering three new degree programs we've never offered here at Augusta University. One of those actually is the first of its kind in the country, a bachelor's degree in biomedical systems engineering. And so we've modeled that after a program at the University of Toronto, but it's the first of its kind in the country. And we have 10 students, I believe, starting that program. Uh, we also are launching an undergraduate degree in neuroscience. And that really supports some of our research investments in recent, uh, recent uh, I guess, the last couple of years in, in neuroscience. And then the third one, actually, is a, another undergraduate degree in sports management. And for that, uh, many of our students will have the opportunity to partner with Augusta National Golf Club and do internships there. So so all those those three programs, very, very different. One at our cyber campus, one at our health sciences campus, and one in our Somerville campus. But I think um, that's our goal is to develop new programs that are appealing to students and meet uh, work, workplace needs as well. Those are great opportunities all across the university. I hope so, yes. <laughs> kind of makes me want to start all over again. Well, we can, it's not too late, Andrew, if you want to. No, you're too busy doing this podcast. So, <laughs> so you, we know you keep a busy schedule. How do you stay informed with current trends and best practices in higher ed? Yeah, you know, that's that certainly is, is a key part of, the, of this role is, you know, what are those trends and making sure that I'm aware and being responsive. Um, pretty much every morning, one of my kind of early morning routines is to check some some of those publications, the Chronicle of Higher Education inside higher ed, just to see, you know, what, what's uh, going on. Um, I also, um, I'm on a texting group and uh, in regular touch with the provost of the other three research intensive universities here in Georgia, so Georgia State, uh, Georgia Tech, and UGA, and we've become friends and exchange information. Uh, but more on a strategic level, I actually block off the first Wednesday of every month uh, which actually will be tomorrow, the time of recording this, um, just for kind of strategic thinking. Mm -hmm. And part of that is uh, includes um, reading, re reports, books, uh, trends going on, but also, of course, taking a look at, at how we're doing it at our university as far as achieving our goals and stuff. And, and you know, uh, sometimes I lose that day of other crises that come up or if the president wants something, but certainly want to encourage every listener, you know, to think about what is their strategic thinking time when they can get away from the day-to-day -day meetings and day-to-day -day drudgery, may not be able to do a, a full day once a month. Maybe it's an afternoon every two weeks, but I think everybody needs that time really to um, think and reflect and look at trends and how they're impacting higher ed. Great advice. Uh, let's talk about mentoring. What role does mentoring play in the growth and improvement of the faculty members here at AU? And what are you doing to help facilitate uh, meaningful mentorship opportunities? Yeah, well, you know, I would argue regardless of the field you're in, whether you're in law or construction or whatever, you need mentors, right? And I think all of us can kind of think back to mentors that really um, gave up their time selfishly and and really just um, just really, you know, made, made a difference. Um, I think when I was a, f a new assistant professor, I was actually assigned a mentor at my university. Uh, now, she happened to be not just a great person, but also an expert on mentoring. She actually wrote a book on mentoring, so oh, wow. I really <laughs> struck the jackpot there. Um, and I think that's that's a, a key part of mentoring. It really kind of takes a, a few different things. It re 
of course requires a knowledge to be a mentor, you know, expertise that the mentee doesn't have, uh, also a commitment to the time that it takes, but also, you know, it's also the, the, the personality. Not everyone is really meant out to be a, a mentor in life as well. And so I think um, it's really a combination of all those factors. Uh, here at Augusta University, you know, it's, it's an interesting time because I think historically this is probably an area we haven't done as, as well. Um, certainly many colleges have informal mentors. Sometimes when deans or department chairs hire faculty, they'll say, you know, they assign a faculty member to be a mentor. Um, but I am excited that we have a new associate dean for faculty affairs or associate provost, sorry, for faculty affairs, uh, Dr. Karen Head, uh, who just joined us um, on July 1st. And this is an area of interest of hers, Andrew. So I know she's interested in starting more formalized mentoring programs. And I think, uh, again, if someone is really mentored the right way, it can put their career in a completely different level and trajectory. And so it's it's critically important. It's not just one of those things, oh, let's do it if we have time or if someone's interested. It actually needs to be a core essential part of, of any university. So I, I first admit, it's something I think we can do a better job of here. But I think with, with Dr. Head's arrival, we'll be in, in a good place. And hopefully, if you invite me back a year or two years from now for this podcast, I'll have more to share on, on what we're doing for mentoring. Sounds like we're moving in the right direction. Yeah. And, and can you discuss the importance of balancing teaching responsibilities with the research and service obligations of faculty and uh, how you help faculty manage these competing demands? Yeah, well, that could be a whole podcast <laughs> in and of itself. It's just like, how do you do that work-life balance? And even within your, your job responsibilities, manage that. And of course, a lot of our faculty here at AU even have a fourth area, which is practice, right? You think of many of our mm -hmm. physicians and nurses and dentists and allied health professionals also are balancing uh, that part. Now, certainly, uh, sometimes there's a difference if, if you're t a tenure track or non-tenure track as far as what those duties. So not every single faculty member has to balance all four. Uh, even here at Augusta University, you know, we have educator track faculty that are primarily focused on, on teaching, for example. We have researchers that are more focused on, on research. But to your question, if you have three or four of those things, it's, it's a challenge. And I think, um, you know, my, my um, advice that I've certainly have shared with, with our deans as well is just let's make sure that our expectations for what faculties will, faculty members will do aligns with the time allocation. So I'll just give you an example. If we're expecting someone to be a research superstar and get federal grants and publish and speak at conferences, but 10% of their effort is assigned to research, they're going to be set up to fail. Um, because you can't have a large, successful research program if you're only allocating, you know, one day every every two weeks on on research. And so I think we're trying to do a better job of aligning that. Um, I know um, I inherited this from the previous provost here, a, a faculty workload uh, commission. And so we're still kind of working our way through that. And I know that's a, a big effort of the faculty senate this year will be to try to create some final recommendations and new policies related to that. So I think in, in life, you know, I think in, in higher ed, uh, faculty are great at multitasking, and, and but at the same time, we want to set them up for success. And, and to me, the main thing is aligning their workload allocation with the expectations. Um, and again, that, that research example, I think, shows that sometimes we, we don't do a good job of that and faculty fail, and we're partially responsible for that. And as provost, what specific services or programs do you prioritize to promote student success? Well, you know, student success in itself has become kind of a, a key buzzword in, in higher education. Um, even here at the University System of Georgia, and we're, you know, one of 26 institutions part of that, um, there's new requirements that came from the University System of Georgia this past year that really mandate, um, you know, you mentioned kind of three other things, um, teaching, service, and research, but now comes a fourth pillar, which is student success. And so we've worked with the Faculty Senate this past year to implement new guidelines related to that. And as faculty are evaluated moving forward, they're also going to be evaluated on, on student success. You know, when I think of student success, I'm going to, you know, I, I actually kind of think of it maybe not so much as a provost, but as a dad, uh, because um, my wife and I, our oldest daughter, uh, was a freshman last year at another university here in Georgia. And, and I think from a parent's perspective, what does it mean for students to succeed? Well, part of it is, you know, to, uh, to uh, complete their courses, get uh, good grades, but also feel like... They're, they're, they're enjoying the university experience. So I would say for student successors, kind of the, the qualitative part, which would be things like student life and activities and sense of belonging. And so for me, I think, you know, if I look at Augusta University, just for example, we have a, a team of students called the crew that are present everywhere and try to create that energy mm -hmm. and sense of belonging. So that's important, but also the quantitative part as well. And that would be things like 
you know, are students actually progressing along? Are they passing the courses? Are they doing it in a timely manner? Are they registered for enough uh, credit hours? And of course, we have things like um, the Center for Writing Excellence. We have the Academic Success Center on that side. So you kind of need both because at the end of the day, you know, when a student crosses the stage, it's really not just the degree, um, but it's also what was their experience like? So hopefully it was four years, not five or six, uh, but we want to be known as a university that really lifts up our students. Fortunately, on a, on a quantitative side, uh, there was some news actually just two weeks ago, a national survey that looked at return on investment of students across the whole country. And they had their top 10 list, the top 10 universities in the country for return on investment. We were number five. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for me, that's really reassuring that for our students that are succeeding, you know, uh, I think return on investment is a big measure of that. You know, well, what kind of job do you get after you graduate? How much money are you making in that? How much student debt do you have? And all those factors were considered in their return on investment. So for us to be number five in the country, and if you look at some other universities on that list, Stanford University, Georgia Tech, there were some better known universities. So I think we're, we're certainly on our way, but we could do, we could still do better, I, I think. And so um, I think for student success, you'll see a lot more activity and effort placed on that by our university uh, moving, moving forward. So a lot of work to do, but we've come pretty far. Right. Yeah. Uh, in a similar line of questioning, are, are there any other examples of successful initiatives aimed at improving student uh, retention and graduation rates that you can talk about? Yeah, well, if I have certainly one major concern from an academic perspective as provost here, you know, Andrew, it would be our um, retention and, and progression rates. Um, and so this, these are rough numbers, but if let's say we had 10 students that start a new academic year as an undergraduate, only seven of those are going to come back for year number two. Uh, another year goes by, uh, only six then would come back for year number three. And of those, only five would actually graduate. And if you do a deeper dive looking at the five that actually graduate, only uh, roughly two to three of those would graduate in four years. So clearly we have some work to do. Um, we're certainly not the level you'd expect of a research intensive university to be at. So we're doing a number of different initiatives. Um, you know, fortunately we have a, a president that really cares about that here at Augusta University, President Keel. And last year he committed 1.5 million in new new dollars um, to really uh, aid in those efforts. And we're doing a lot of different things for that. Um, part of that is for the first time in the history of our university, we have a strategic enrollment management plan. Sounds like kind of a complex thing, but basically what it is, is how do we get uh, more of those 10 students to keep going on and, and to graduate? So there's a whole working group. It's a mix of faculty and staff and administrators with different strategies. But we're also trying to be smarter. And part of that is better use of data analytics. So part of the president's funds were, were, was to mine our data and identify those students at risk of failing. We're partnering with a company called OThought, and they've developed a predictive model. And what they do is they identify, looking at our own data in the past, they're saying, hey, this student, this student's really at risk for not progressing. And then we're developing strategies to come alongside that student and help him or her um, succeed and to finish. So it's a combination of, I think, maybe some of those data analytic tools we haven't had in the past to help, but also comes back to those things, you know, I mentioned in the last question around student success, which is that sense of belonging and caring. Do students really feel this is a home? Do they feel part of Jaguar Nation? And so I think you'll see a lot of activity around that because at the end of the day, that does bother me that we lose so many students. We really shouldn't be like that. I think for us, you know, I would like to, of course, see all 10 of those students go yeah. go forward and, and, to, and to see them when they cross the stage at commencement. We're probably not going to get quite there, uh, but certainly uh, our efforts, we have, we have goals to increase the bar and increase the number of students that do graduate and graduate on time. Very good. Before we take a break, uh, is there anything that we didn't touch on you want to talk about? No, I'm just, you know, thrilled about this podcast. Uh, the topics that you're covering here are so critical in higher ed. I know probably some of your listeners are here internal to AU, some are external, but uh, these are common challenges um, across higher education. Of course, they're not even limited to the United States. And so just uh, hopefully this has provided some, you know, insight in what, how we're tackling these issues here at AU, but also um, I think uh, this is an opportunity to hear from others, you know, through comments and, and other things on what, what are other, other universities doing to address student success and really improve their, their graduation rates. Absolutely. Well, let's take a quick break. We'll come back with our continuing the conversation question. The Open Paws Food Pantry provides food and toiletry items for any currently enrolled Augusta University student who visits one of the two pantry locations. Please consider donating needed items such as non-perishable food and drink, hygiene products, and school supplies. Donations may be dropped off at either location, 
on the Somerville campus in Bellevue Hall and on the Health Sciences campus on the second floor of the Student Center. Both locations are open Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. until 5 p.m. If you know a student who may need assistance, they can find more information by visiting augusta.edu and search for open pause or by stopping by one of the pantry locations. As we wrap up, I want to ask you our continuing the conversation question, which is, as we kick off the fall semester, what words of encouragement do you have for the faculty across our university and the broader higher ed community? Yeah, well, I, and if I can, I'll expand that to the professional staff, which, which of course, play a key role in, in any successful university. But, uh, you know, we're really blessed. And I think, you know, take a step back, you know, every industry, every sector has its own challenges. And certainly we're not without some challenges. But we're really blessed in that we're a field. Um, we do things where we can impact lives on a daily basis. And just like I shared kind of at the start of this podcast, thinking of certain students that have of mine that have gone on and done great things, um, you know, we really have a noble calling. And it doesn't make us, you know, better than other people or anything like that, but it really is, I think, a special calling um, where uh, we can change lives. Um, the individuals that come in perhaps at age 18, they leave at 22, or a graduate student is coming kind of mid-career to upgrade their credentials. And so for me, that, that's, that's not lost on me, where, um, you know, with that calling comes a lot of responsibility, where, uh, you know, parents, for example, are entrusting us, you know, with their 18, 19-year-olds saying, you know, take good care of them. And so for, for me, um, again, having that responsibility, um, that, that calling, it kind of comes together in that uh, the start of every academic year is a very special time, right? We get that energy, that buzz of the new students coming in and that nervousness also of like, you know, what is university life going to be like for me? And so you put it together, it's this kind of really emotional mix at the start of the academic year, but it's my favorite time of the year as well. And of course, you know, commencement is great, you know, and seeing students cross the stage, but there's something special about the start, the newness, oh, there's a new opportunity. And I think, you know, especially this year, Andrew, where I mentioned, you know, we've got three new degrees that for the first time ever, we're going to have students in those degree programs. So think about that. These are students that they're the first cohort in these degrees um, programs. So you put it together. Um, I would just say, you know, just thankful for our faculty and professional staff that come alongside our students, but also think about the noble calling that they have and the, and the ability that they have to impact lives on, on a daily basis. Wonderful. Well, thanks for this great conversation. How can listeners connect with you, connect with you on social media? Yeah, well, I'm at uh, uh, AUG underscore provost on uh, Twitter, or I guess it's X now, sorry, uh, <laughs> X and uh, uh, Instagram. Uh, of course, I have a LinkedIn profile as well, but it's, um, I think social media is, is definitely um, sometimes an underused resource. And so for me, I just like to share kind of what's going on at the university and also use it as a tool to lift others up. Uh, again, whether it's fantastic uh, alums, students, faculty, or staff. Um, every day I'm in contact with just amazing people. And so I use it as a tool as well just to showcase some of the cool people I get to work with. It's very impressive, your use of social media. I, I think you know more about it than I do. And, <laughs> uh, so it's it's fun to follow along and, and see, what, see what you're up to. Well, thanks again for being here. I appreciate it. I also want to thank our listeners. Please take a moment to rate, review, subscribe, and share. Speaking of higher ed. We release new episodes the third Wednesday of each month in spring and fall semesters. You can find the resources today we discussed today on our show page at augusta.edu forward slash innovation. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash A-U-G-C-I-I. You can also email us at C-I-I at augusta.edu. Speaking of higher ed is produced by the Center for Instructional Innovation at Augusta University.